We are closing out our series, walking through the book of Galatians. And for, I think for this church, for all of us, as we've walked through this, if we've really leaned in, um, I'm hearing stories of people saying, I have never like, thought through what's, what Paul is writing in the, the, the book of Galatians, or, or we're wrestling with questions, or we're wrestling with the what does this look like lived out, uh, big questions that, that should come our way when we spend time in Scripture. And so this is the, the last piece of it, and it's such a beautiful part, as we've walked our way through this letter that Paul wrote to this church that, that, that we see as he creates tension, and he gives the, the truth of what's actually, like, what's actually true in this world. This is the moment, if you're tracing the, the journey that Paul has been taking us on, this is the moment where Paul says, so this is what this looks like lived out, right? It's the, it's the turn at the end of this, really a sermon letter that Paul is writing to this church. So he says, so, so this is what it looks like for us to take hold of this and to actually live differently because of this. To give foundation for what we're going to talk about, the, the, the solution that has been offered to by people around the Galatian church and people maybe inside the Galatian church was the way that we please God was by, by following the law, by participating in certain things, by doing certain things, and, and by that, making God happy. Right? The way that we stay in right relationship or get in right relationship is by, is by things that we do. And Paul, with some pretty forceful language, says this is, that is just simply not true. Right? It's destructive. It leads to a transactional relationship with God instead of something that, that starts in, in, a, deep, in a, deep thing, a deep way in us, this transformational journey that God's inviting us into. And so this tension that Paul is addressing, this, this tension that we have where we want to get things right, where we want to like, figure out what is it that we're supposed to do to make God happy, to give us a cer- certain amount of confidence in ourselves or at least in our situation with God because we feel like we're in control. And Paul says it's, it's not what you think, right? As tempting as it would be to lean into that, as, 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 as sure as we are that we would like to be the ones in control, that, that God created a different kind of system and it's a better system for us. And so by way of foundation, I'm going to make two statements, these, these two truths that, that create a foundation for, for the rest of the conversation this morning. I think we'll probably agree with one of them. Some of you might not like what I say with the second one, but it's still true. Um, first one, this will be one where a lot of us will nod our heads and say, yeah, I agree with this. Two, first one, we live in a world that's a mess. I don't see it like a whole lot of like shake, heads shaking, no, like you are completely off base. We live in a world that's a mess, right? And it has been a mess from really from, the, from the, almost the very beginning that once humanity leaned in, exercised their will, made their decisions and, 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 and chose a path that was not what God had, had designed us for, that we look at the world and it has perpetually been a mess. So that's, that's truth number one. Most of us like that one. Truth number two, we're also a mess, Right? It's not so much fun, is it? <laughs> um, the window is way more fun than the mirror. I'll just say that, right? It was way more fun to, to look out and say, well, look at what, it's just such a mess out there. Um, and then when it becomes a mirror and we look at that and say, well, boy, that's a whole lot less fun, right? That's a whole lot less fun to look and say, there are things in my life, there are things that, that are true of me that, that are just messy, right? That, that just don't seem to be right, that, but it's true, right? That, that, that the, we live in a world that's a mess and that we're also a mess, and so our big challenge, and this is what Paul is pushing the church to, to really wrestle this down is, as he's writing to this Galatian church, is they've been offered this solution of saying, so, so try harder, do more, trying to like go back to some old ways that, that felt a little more stable and secure, all these kinds of things that Paul says, so, so it's, it's, it's a mess. The world is a mess. We're a mess. Everything is a mess, right? And there is good news, or we'll get to that, but... Um, The challenge for us is the same challenge that the church, the Galatian church faced 2,000 years ago, is that we have to learn. We have to learn to deal with the mess of the world and the mess of our own lives in a healthy way. How do we do this? How do we wrestle this one down? How is it that, that we can engage in a world that, that's, that's just the, the, the more news that we read and the things that we see as, as, as things are, are coming our direction that we look and we say, it is just such a mess. And then we go living our lives and we see things that show up in our lives and it's, where did that come from? And, and why am I doing this? And why am I reacting like this? And we can say, so I, there's, a, there's a mess in the world and there's a mess in us. How do we deal with this in a healthy way? And what we're really talking about, what does it look like? What does it look like for the kingdom to show up in our lives and in the world around us? What does it look like for us to lean in and be a kingdom people, right? The kingdom of God in a world that, that's anything but that. What does it look like to, to bring the kingdom in some ways or to participate in the kingdom as, as, as God is at work in this world around us. 
one way to do that. And this is what Paul is writing so forcefully against. I'll give it just before I even say it, that, that this is what Paul is saying. This is what we don't do. But there is a human tendency. The, the drift is in this direction. Two ways to, to bring something like the kingdom. The first would be to, to create a system of rules to control behavior. Say, so, so here's the boundaries. And here is what we do and what we don't do. And if, if it seems like somebody's straying beyond that, then, then maybe we need to make a new rule, right? Most rules have, a, have an origin story, right? Have you noticed this? That there's a reason why we're, we, we don't do certain things. It's because somebody did it and it wasn't a good idea. And so we say, well, let's just not do that anymore. Uh, my brothers and I, when we were kids, we were kind of like the outdoor kids all the time. Was, school would start at the, at the beginning of the school year and so all I wanted to do was look out the window and imagine what summer was like, right? I just want to be outside doing things and playing and Eventually, if you spend a whole lot of time in a group of kids, eventually you will start to create a game, right? Well, the problem is it's like it can go from, you know, like, hey, I, I'm going to throw this stick and it's going to hit that thing. And then all of a sudden it's, well, I bet I can throw that stick a little better than you can, right? This, this is like not a great game. I don't know where this example is even coming from. But, um, <laughs> so invariably, one of us would try and get an advantage. And so you... So we've got to make a rule that would keep them from, from doing that, right? So we start to create a parameter. And then all of a sudden, by the time the, the, the game was over, we're all fighting with each other because the rules have become so restricted that the game just isn't fun anymore. <laughs> so we create a system of rules to control behavior. Which, which works for a short time, right? We, this, this can work. This is what Paul is, is saying. So, so the problem is this is like a, a short-term solution. We kind of stamp out bad behavior. We stamp out things. And we, and we, we create this, 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 this list of rules. We say, so just don't do this. And, and we create new rules and, and all these kinds of things. But it works for a short time if we're talking about the way that we, that we leverage our kingdom relationship in the world around us. That it works for a short time as, as long as the risk and reward equation works in favor of the rules being followed, right? As long as it makes sense, as long as it seems like it's, it's, it's a good way forward, as long as it seems to, to have some sort of tangible benefit that, that, that we will follow the rules. The problem is that becomes transactional. So if I follow the rules, if I do all the right things, then surely God will be happy with me. Right? Way more happy with me than people who don't follow the rules. Way more happy with me than with people who, who don't seem to do all the kinds of things and check all the kinds of boxes and all these sorts of things. That it becomes a transactional way of operating in relationship with God. And we do this, we even apply this to other people when we start to create these kinds of rules that, that we actually create this sort of transactional environment. You could say this isn't bringing the kingdom. This is kingdom-ish. Right? It's, it's sort of like the kingdom. Because it's sort of like this redeemed way of living. It's sort of like a culture that, that reflects the values of God. But it's, but it's reflective of the values of God and reflective of, of Christian values only because we've, we've created parameters and rules to, to, to keep the situation in control. So it's true personally. It's true organizationally. The other way to bring the kingdom is to be a transforming presence. Say, God, do in me what you want to do around me. Transform me, and God, work through me, work in my life and through my life. This model, instead of this being a transactional kingdom-ish sort of way of operating, this, this is the kingdom unfolding in our midst. We go into a, a difficult place, we go into a difficult environment, a difficult relationship, a difficult situation, and we come in, and we say, God, do in me. God, do in me what you need to do through me in this situation. God, do in me what you need to do through me and, and, and how you need to work through me in this community and in this culture and in this world that, that God, start with me and, and, and work through me. The kingdom unfolding in our midst. Paul writes in Galatians chapter four a, a version of this and he uses some, some pretty visceral language. He says, oh my dear children, Galatians 4.19, oh my dear children, I feel as if I'm going through labor pains for you again. Right? Paul says, this is painful. Right? This is painful to, to, to go through. I feel like I'm going through labor pains for you again. And they will continue until Christ is fully developed in your lives. Paul says, this is what it looks like for the, for the, for the kingdom, for, for, for Jesus to, 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 to be formed in our midst. Paul says, it's painful, right? The process of this development, the process of, of this unfolding, this, this unfolding of the kingdom in our midst is it's a, it's a tough and difficult way forward. It's, it's the right way. 
And Paul uses this powerful imagery that, that reflects the growing pains and the birth pains and all the kinds of things that go with that. Because what Paul is getting at is something that Jesus talked about repeatedly as he, as he walked this earth, is that it, it starts with us. It starts in us. And what we have to do, our response is to trust God, which we've already established over multiple points along this, along this series, is, is trust is difficult, right? Because trust, we can, we, can have, we, have, we can have that shaken or have that broken. and Trust God to deal with the disease instead of us trying to deal with the symptoms. I wrote something in my notes, and I'm just, I'm just going to read it because I, I, I want to make sure that this is phrased in the, in the, in the proper kind of way said, the great, challenge, the great challenge for the church and our culture is to be a voice that points to a better way while meeting people where they are. We talk of transformed lives in the midst of a culture that values what they would describe as authentic expression, which is really the celebration and validation of whatever brokenness a person is using to fill the void in their lives. To speak of transformation and surrender to a better way is countercultural. And that's why we have to let God work in us first. To be a transforming presence means that we have to be transformed ourselves. Paul, as he's walking through the book of Galatians, or he's writing the letter of, to the Galatian church, says, so, so it starts in us. Right? This big thing that God is doing, this, this world changing, this, this thing that, that changes culture, that, that, that changes the course of history, starts as, as God gets to work in his people. The problem is we tend to want to deal with the symptoms instead of the disease or because things pop up and things show up. And so we say, how do we, how do we prevent that particular symptom or how do we stop that symptom without, without ever going deeper and dealing with the disease? We have a long history as a people of this. So what Paul is talking about is he's talking to the Galatian church. It's what shows up throughout scripture is as you say, I'm more interested in, in what's happening in here because the things that you're doing and the behaviors that you're doing and, and, the, and, the, and the things that are being expressed into the, into the world around you are the result of what's happening in you. That comes from somewhere. And so what does this look like when we deal with the symptoms? It, it leads to us operating in fear instead of in freedom. And what if this symptom shows up? What if someone notices that this is true in my life? What if someone notices that, that there's this un, undealt with issue in my life and I'm, I'm operating in fear in relationship with God, I'm operating in fear with, in relationship with others? instead of letting God do this deeper work that allows us to live in freedom in relationship with him, which is a significant part of the thread that, that Paul is writing as he, as, he, as he writes this letter to the church. It's fear versus freedom. It's also hiding versus an open way of living in relationship with God. Right? Adam and Eve led the way for us in this, that, that when they sinned, that very first sin, that, that they hid from God that there became a barrier in relationship, that they actually didn't just, just like have distance, but they created distance because they were worried that God would see what was happening in their lives. Versus this, open, this openness in a relationship with God. When we deal with symptoms, when we push symptoms down, when we push tendencies down, that what we find is when we're, when we're operating and we say sometimes like, my, my filter is broken, right? These things happen. Um, it's because we're trying to tamp down and filter out the stuff that we don't want to have be seen in our lives. And so what shows up, maybe when we get tired, what shows up when we get under pressure, what shows up when, these things, when, when things are happening is, is these impulses that we're like, where did that even come from? I didn't even realize, I thought I had dealt with that. What we had done is we had created some sort of, of filter in our lives or some sort of, 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 of blockade in our lives to, to keep that thing from showing up, but it's still there festering. And God wants to deal with something deeper than just the symptom. It's hard to see this in ourselves. And so we settle for something less. We, we can't imagine a better life, a, a better way to live, so we settle for something less. But the beautiful thing is, is there is evidence that there is a better way all around us. Right? Woven throughout Scripture, Paul writing to the Galatian church saying, there is a better way. If we start to pay attention, we'll start to see that it's there. If we start to pay attention to our lives, we'll start to see that that it's there, the seeds of, of what we're talking about is there. We start paying attention to our lives, but it leads to some big questions. Questions like, well, where did that come from? Right? Have any of us ever had moments like that where, wow, where did, where did that come Where we have this impulse or this, this reaction that, that reveals our hearts, something deeper than just whatever filter we've created. And we look and we say, well, that's, that's not me. 
right? That, I, that, 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 I, don't, I don't do that. That's, that's not me. Well, the problem is if someone's real honest looking back at us saying, well, it was you. You actually said that, right? You actually did that thing. You can say it's not you all you want, but it's, but it's in there somewhere. You said it. It's you whether you like it or not. <laughs> um, questions like, why can't I let go of? Right? Dwelling on things that have happened to us. Dwelling on these things that, that, that we're allowing to, to fester in our lives, this, this unforgiveness or the things that, are, that, are, that have happened to us. Why, right here, why do I keep doing, and I wrote dot, dot, dot in my notes because we all have maybe something in our lives where it's like, why do I keep going back to that behavior? Why do I keep going back to that thing? What is it that, that's a hang up in my life that, that causes me to go back to that same thing? I wrote under this, I said, so I know what this leads to in my life. Why do I keep going there? And I see this in conversation and in counseling environments and these kinds of things where it's, it's a cycle of guilt and shame that, the lies that show up in our lives, the lies that the enemy loves to tell us that, that God wouldn't accept us. The lies that tell us that God wouldn't accept us are the same lies that seem to give us permission to make the wrong choice over and over and over again. I might as well. Right? If I can't get it right anyways, if God isn't going to accept me anyways, if God doesn't want to have anything to do with me anyways, if I've already completely broken my life, then, then why not? Or maybe the question that drives some of us is a question that says, so why am I so scared of? Dot, dot, dot. Right? We have a, all have different ways of, of feeling it. Why is it that I'm so afraid of when it comes to that particular category? This is that freedom versus fear. This is us being driven by worry and uncertainty in our lives instead of living in freedom that comes with God leading. Right? The peace that comes with saying, God, I just want to be in step with you. I just want to follow you. I want to, I want to go where you want me to go and, and do what you want me to do that there is this great lie that is almost perpetually spoken into our lives. That it's a lie of, of distance and disapproval from God. That God is, is far away. And that if he even would look upon you from that great distance, that he would look upon you and he would not approve. Right? The, the lie of distance and disapproval. There's a difference. There's a difference between holy fear of God an unhealthy fear of God. Holy fear says, God, I want to be what you want me to be. And so if there's things that, that, are, not, that are present in my life and things I, that, that I'm holding on to or things that are, that are showing up in my life, God, I, I want your holiness in my life in this area. God, would you, would you help me deal with this? Versus an unhealthy fear that says, if, if this distant and disapproving God would see that this was present, then, then I'm really in trouble. And so I'm going to hide it. I'm going to keep it from him. I'm not going to let him see it. I'm not gonna, certainly not going to let him help me deal with it. And so now good news, right? We've created, I think, enough tension as we move into this passage that the good news for us and for those who have gone before us is that there is real hope. That there is real hope. Paul, writing in Galatians chapter 5, verse 13, says, For you have been called. For you have been called to live in freedom, my brothers and sisters. He says, But don't use your freedom to satisfy your sinful nature. Instead, use your freedom to serve one another in love. What we do with our freedom matters, right? It reveals so much about us. So if, if we are free, and if we're free to do what we have free will, and we're free to do what we want to do, then, then what is it that we do with that? That just as the law revealed our brokenness, that, that freedom reveals our brokenness as well. Paul says, for the whole law can be summed up in this one command, love your neighbor as yourself. But if you're always biting and devouring one another, watch out. Beware of destroying one another. And then Paul begins to provide the solution. He says, so I say, so I say, let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. If you're a person who underlines passages in Scripture, if, there's a pers- if you're a kind of person who makes notes in the margins of your Bible, this might be one to, to highlight. Right? This might be one to underline and say, so I say, Right? If there's a, an option, if we're making a choice about the, the direction of our lives and the way that, that, that we're, we're making the decisions in our lives, so Paul says, so I say, let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. Then you won't be doing what your sinful nature craves. So the sinful nature wants to do evil, which is just the opposite 
of what the Spirit wants. For some of us, we're hearing this. Maybe we've not spent time in this particular passage. And all of a sudden, it's like Paul is, is speaking right to our hearts and diagnosing the, the, some of the deepest issues in our lives. Say, I just can't seem to get it right because every time I, I, I'm faced with a decision, I, I seem to make the wrong choice. And Paul says, so, so maybe it's an issue of who you're allowing to control your life. He says, The sinful nature wants to do evil, which is just the opposite of of what the Spirit wants. And the Spirit gives us desires that are the opposite of what the sinful nature desires. It says these two forces, right? Some of us have felt this quite literally. These two forces are constantly fighting each other. So you are not free to carry out your good intentions. It says, but when you're directed by by the Spirit, you are not under obligation to the law of Moses. Or we talked about, last week we talked about you put the, putting the typewriter aside and saying there is this, the, the computer, right? This, this new era, this new way of operating a relationship with God that, that the law would, would, would bring us to this point. But, but what, what is now available through the Holy Spirit, through the work that Jesus did for us, through the Spirit that he sent to guide us is, has rendered what was obsolete. And to put a handle on what Paul is getting at is that that fruit, we're talking about bearing fruit this morning, that fruit is produced relationally with God. We talk about bearing fruit in our lives. We talk about what does it look like for us to, to have things that emerge from our lives and behaviors that emerge from our lives that, 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 that would honor God. The way that we get there is by being in relationship with God. Right? We don't bear fruit and then, expect, and then we like try and trade that fruit to God for a relationship. Say, God, look, look what I have done. Look what I managed to make happen. And so now would you accept me? But it starts with, with a deepening relationship with God. That fruit, that fruit is produced relationally with God. It's not produced transactionally in our lives so we can offer it to God as, as some sort of means of, of creating a right relationship with him that everything we do is in response to what God has done for us through Jesus Christ. And so fruit is produced relationally with God. Verse 19. When you follow the desires of your sinful nature, the results are very clear. This is Paul putting a fine point on his argument. The results are very clear. Sexual immorality, impurity, lustful pleasures, idolatry, sorcery, hostility, quarreling, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambition, dissension, division, envy, drunkenness, wild parties, and other sins like these. Let me tell you again, as I have said before, that anyone living that sort of life will not inherit the kingdom of God. We talk about living in a world that's a mess. We could take that list and we look and, and just follow through the, our news feed. We just follow through the, as we read the, the, the newspaper. We watch what's happening in the world around us. That, that the kinds of things that Paul is describing are, are no different now 2,000 years later. That, that human nature, that sinful nature takes us to, to expected kinds of places. There is nothing new under the sun. But Paul says, let me tell you again, as I've said before, that anyone living that sort of life will not inherit the kingdom of God because that is the fruit, right? That is the fruit of allowing our sinful nature to run rampant in our lives. But, right, I said there's good news, verse 22, but the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against these things, right? Paul playing with the language of, of are we following the law or do we need to follow the rules, all those kinds of things. That, he says, so this is what it looks like. And in verse 24, those who belong to Christ Jesus have nailed the passions and desires of their sinful nature to his cross and crucified them there. Since we are living by the Spirit, let us follow the Spirit's leading in every part of our lives. Let us not become conceited or provoke one another or be jealous of one another. Fruit is expressed relationally toward others. So we look at these lists and we look at the way that the sinful nature shows up and it's selfishness and it's, and it's the, the us orientation and the, and the what do I want and what, what is it that, that's driving me and these carnal desires and all these kinds of things. And it's, and it's a selfish, self-directed, like pleasure-seeking sort of way of living. And then the fruit that comes through the Spirit, as the Spirit works in us, does this transforming work in us, as God steps into our story and, and changes us in a deeper and better kind of way than just in establishing a, a good filter, that the fruit that emerges from this is expressed relationally toward others. 
right? How do we relate to each other? How do we relate to people around us? And it's the, the fruit of God at work in us. So how do we know how we're doing? How do, how do we know where we're standing? It's, it's the way that we relate to other people. This is why Paul says it's so important that we pay attention to, to how we love one another. Because the way that we make sense of the fruit that's showing up in our lives is, is how do we relate to each other? Am I simply trying to just gather as much as I can for myself? Or am I operating with patience and gentleness and all these kinds of things and in a way that, that's expressed relation, relationally toward others? Because God's intention all along is for us to live in healthy community. Paul says verse, in verse 1 of chapter 6, continuing, he says, Dear brothers and sisters, if another believer is overcome by some sin, you who are godly should, should gently and humbly help that person back onto the right path. And be careful not to fall into the same temptation yourself. Share each other's burdens, and in this way obey the law of Christ. And then possibly one of my favorite verses of the, of the whole letter to the Galatian church coming up, Paul says, If you think... If you think you're too important to help someone, you are only fooling yourself. You are not that important. <laughs> Isn't that, it's like, what? That doesn't sound like Shakespeare. That sounds like, like Paul's poking us, right? He's really, he's like pushing us. He says, look, if you think, if you think you're too important to help somebody, he ain't that important, right? You're, you're not that important. You're just fooling yourself. Because the way that this shows up, what we are called to is to live in healthy relationship with each other, not because we've created good filters, not because we've established certain rules and parameters to, to try and keep the peace, but because God is at work in us, that we're chasing after him, that, that we're, we're chasing after what he wants to do in us so that we can relate in a healthy way to each other. And Paul putting a fine point on it, I think with a, probably a twinkle in his eye saying, so if you think, right, if you think you're too important, you might not be all the way there yet, right? There might be something that God still needs to keep doing in you because you're not that important. You're only fooling yourself. He says, so pay attention. Pay careful attention to your own work for then you will get the satisfaction of a job well done and you won't need to compare yourself to anyone else for we are each responsible for our own conduct. Paul says, so what does this look like? Have we really leaned into this? What would it look like as a, as, a, as a community of people who are chasing after the things of God? What would it look like for us to, to really take hold of this? And Paul says, well, I can tell you some of the first things to fall are, are going to be pride and comparison and competition. That the first things, if we really leaned into this kingdom way of living, this kingdom way of operating that, that moves beyond kingdom-ish to real kingdom, that it's, it's emerging in our midst that some of the first things that are going to fall are, are competition, comparison, and pride. That we realize just how much we need a God to step into our story. That we realize just how much we all need. And instead of comparing ourselves or competing with other people, we say, how do I help someone else take their next step? How do I help somebody else on their journey? Because there's, I'm not diminished in any way by someone else growing closer to God also. To put a fine point on it, we could say that fruit sustains Christian community. It's the together part of the call that we have as a people of God. That fruit is, is produced relationally in our lives, right, in connection with, with the Holy Spirit. That it's expressed relationally toward others. And that it sustains Christian community. How beautiful is it? Because God knew when, when he was working through his son, Jesus Christ, on this earth, that, that the way that we were going to make it successfully as the people of God was, is that we journey together. And so God, working in us, made us better at doing things together, right? Made us better at operating in a healthy relationship with each other. That, that, that the more that God got a hold of our lives, the better we got at helping other people see God clearly. So God says, keep leaning in, keep pushing ahead, keep pushing forward, keep trusting me and allowing me to work because the more you do that, the, the healthier the community, the connection, you, the, the, the community that you have, the healthier you are, the healthier your community will be. The together part of this Christian journey. And so what does this look like for us to, to lean into this? What does it look like for us to take hold of what, what Paul is inviting us to as God is speaking through him and inviting us to, to live in a different and better kind of way? I made a list of, of three things, three next steps for us. The first one, the first one is to make the right choice about who's in charge. Make the right choice about who's in charge. Spend some time wrestling with, am I relying on my will? 
Saying, man, I, just, I think I see what God's wanting me to do. And for some of us, we're even looking at this and we, we can even hear Paul saying, so, so don't try and do this yourself. You, you will never produce the kind of fruit that, that God can produce through your lives by, by just simply willing yourself to do this. That we can hear this and we can hear Paul saying, this is not a transaction with God. We don't bear fruit to trade it to God so that, so that he'll like us better. That, that it's something that God does in us for the, for the benefit of those around us and for the benefit of creating healthy community. Make the right choice about who's in charge. Let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. Right? Paul putting a fine point on, what, on the what do we do with what, what we've been learning. That this is not a matter of will. Of us saying, so I think I know what God wants me to do and so I'm just going to leverage my will and work so hard to make this happen. Instead, we operate guided by the Holy Spirit. Right? Still a free people, still a free people, but, but called to follow. And God looks at our lives and says, it's better if we do this freely, if they make the choice to follow me, if they lean in because they want what I'm offering them. It's the better way. Paul would maybe say, as if he was talking to us this morning, that let's talk about the best expression of our freedom. What should we do with the freedom that we've been given? This first step, this make the right choice about who's in charge, actually is the only point in which we have, th- that we can make a choice about the kind of fruit that's produced in our lives. Because we can't just simply say, I want to do these things, I want to produce this fruit. goes back to, well, who's in control? And who's doing the transforming? And who's doing the operating? And who, and who, is, who is leading your life? The only way to choose fruit in your life is by choosing who's in charge, to follow the Spirit. The only way to choose, this is the only way to choose fruit in your life. Because it's the outcome of the right input. If we don't make this choice, if we say, well, I'm going to produce fruit, I'm going to try and produce fruit, the, the result, if we don't make the decision about who's in charge, then what we end up with is, is legalism and pride. Because then we think that anything we've produced is because we followed the, these parameters or because we created in ourselves the, the fruit. Second, pay attention to the fruit in your lives. Pay attention to the fruit in your life. This is the part that's painful. Right? This is the part that requires it, not just be, being a window and looking out at the world, but a mirror looking back at us that so we can look at our own lives and say, so what is showing up? And we take captive these moments where maybe we surprise ourselves. We say, so why am I reacting like this? We, we, maybe we ask the question, what does my reaction say about me? Right? Then we look and we say, so, so what is it that, that's happening? And, and God, what is it that you're trying to show me? What is it that you're, that you're wanting to reveal in me that, that, that things are happening in this sort of way? How do we know how we're doing? The fruit reveals, right? Just like any other plant or tree or anything else that, that, that grows fruit is that, is that we look and we say, so how do we know if it's healthy? We look at the fruit that's being, being produced. Remembering that that fruit is expressed relationally. So it's when we spend time with people, when we spend time in community. This is why small groups matter, why, why discipleship conversations over coffee or wherever it is that, that we have these kinds of conversations. It matters because the way we relate to others reveals the way that God is bearing fruit in our lives or, or not. Pay attention to the fruit in your life and help each other. Right. Such a simple kind of like final, what do we do with this? But Paul repeatedly throughout this chapter speaks of what does it look like for us to, to care deeply about the fruit that's, that's in other people's lives, for us to, to see that maybe there's something that's showing up that's, man, that's just not right. And let, let me help you see what you can't see. Let me help you deal with a blind spot or let me help you do, like, operate in some sort of corrective sort of way. But we do that without competition, without comparison, and without pride. That we're simply interested in helping other people bear good fruit in their lives as well. Because sometimes, and I'll close with this, sometimes, sometimes our best fruit grows on someone else's tree. And that's a good thing. That's a Christ-like thing. Can you imagine what it would look like as a Christian community to say, I am so much more interested, not in just bearing fruit myself, but, but leveraging my life and leveraging my story and doing everything I can to help good fruit grow on other people's trees. It would radically transform the way we operate in relationship with each other. It would radically transform the way that, that we operate as a community. It would radically transform the way that, we, that we, the way we, we operate in relationship with the community and with the world around us to be a people of good fruit, not just for ourselves, but, but in the lives of others. Our best fruit growing on other people's trees.